Mm -hmm. uh, hey everyone, hey everyone on YouTube. Today I'm going to present, well, lead the discussion about a paper that studies MRI scans using what they call graph neural networks. Well, it's a bit different than what I would I was expecting to see actually. The fun part is that they study a temporal graph, which means the graph changes over time uh, because that's how uh, the brain is modeled, or actually the, the MRI scans of the brain are modeled. And we will do uh, quite a few experiments looking at which parts of the model uh, are most important. And there is also a, a fair amount of explainability uh, because that's always difficult and important. Uh, okay. So the paper is mostly from University of Cambridge, Pietro Leo's group, um, collaboration with, uh, uh, with the University of Rome. Uh, okay. So let's start with introduction. So we are going to look at this RSF MRI scan. If anyone has any medical background, feel free to explain more uh, of how this works. But my understanding is uh, we take a scan of the, of the brain uh, and we actually manually create uh, uh, sections from the brain, uh, which become nodes in our graph and they're um, th their uh, correlation metrics, uh, which are also hand computed, become weights on edges. And then we might also do a bit of truncation. So if the weight is too low, we might just remove that, that edge. So this means the graph is not directed. Uh, this matters because uh, one of the algorithms that we use is actually designed for directed graphs. So we will have to convert this into a directed graph. I found this part a bit funny because normally you start with undirected graphs and then if you have directed, you try to adjust the other way around. But here we have the opposite situation. Uh, the important thing in this study is that uh, the observations also have a time direction because we observe uh, how brain parts uh, interact between each other over time. So this adds an extra time dimension in our graph. So uh, to make it clear, uh, the graph does not change over time. We have the same nodes. What changes is the weights on edges. That's my understanding in any, any way, uh, which is a uh, relatively uh, a uh, simpler case than changing nodes. We had one paper a while back when that started uh, adding nodes because removing nodes is even harder. But here we have a fixed nodes and the uh, weight on edges change over time. Any comments here? Okay, it seems like I made the problem setting uh, clear. So uh, let's talk about the components. Uh, so we will have an end-to-end -end model. And in our model, the time, uh, time, time component, time direction will be modeled using a, a CNN, a, a temporal CNN. It's a, basically a convolution over, over time. And they also experiment with an RNN, which actually gives same results, but with a so much higher computational cost, several times slower, but that's, I guess, not new. It's just to uh, confirm what uh, we could assume from the beginning. On the other hand, to model the special uh, uh, relationships inside the graph, we will use a graph neural network. Because that makes sense, right? We have a graph, so we want to model relationships between nodes using a graph neural network. Actually, this is 
I, I've read quite a few JLM papers, but the graph neural network they use here is a, a bit different from everything else I've seen before. So that's interesting. Uh, they do quite a few experiments studying each part of the, the impact of each part in the proposed uh, algorithm. And finally enough, again, this may be the first time I see it in a paper, in the ablation study, they actually discovered that one of the components used in the model does not help, doesn't hurt, but it doesn't help, which is very interesting. It's a very uh, open mind paper, which is always welcome to see. Okay, oop, click somewhere wrong, let's go back. Okay, so, so far I'm only saying kind of abstract things about how the modeling works. I'm just trying to make sure I didn't miss anything important. As I said, we are using the temporal convolutional network uh, for the time uh, component and the GNN for the spatial, spatial space component. Uh, this main experiment is done on the UK biobank dataset, which are uh, RSF MRI scans of uh, more than 30,000 distinct people. So each person has one scan here. There is another data set where each person has four scans, but in this one, it's uh, one person, one scan. Uh, and I think we have 400 time steps. We will confirm that later in the experiments, but the time steps are relatively long. Uh, Another important thing here is that all graphs in our database, all, all scans, will have the same uh, number of nodes, which also gives us more options in our modeling. And we'll see why later. But that's also a nice property of, of the data set we have. Um, there is another experiment later done on the Human Con Connectome Project data set. This one has multiple scans per person, but here we basically study uh, just another data set to study uh, the same model. And then we will also compare both models to uh, also non deep learning methods, and then we'll see how their performance uh, differs uh, for each database. Um, there is another interesting experiment at the end where they uh, create a multi-model data set. So taking inputs from different sources. Uh, and that's also quite interesting, but also I guess confirming uh, known properties of deep learning models. We'll get to it at the end, hopefully. Uh, yeah, there is quite, quite a lot to cover, but nothing too difficult. Um, I think that's all I had for introduction. Mm, any questions, comments here? Ah, well, the contributions of the paper. I should make it very clear because the main contribution that they do here is that uh, they preserve both the graph structure and the time component in the, in the data. Because every other work before this either averages uh, weights over time or uh, collapses the, the graph structure. So this was this is the first paper that actually enables keeping both dimensions uh, in the ML model, which is actually quite cool. Okay. Uh, sorry, quick question. Yeah. Just to double check, uh, the data is uh, snapshots of the same graph taken at different uh, time time steps like at different times is that what the data is mm -hmm. okay yes yes i think so yeah and okay. um, snapshots as in as time progresses we, well basically the, the scan there's mri uh, well the the fs rs fmri scan this uh collects data over time uh from the brain so you have multiple snapshots of the same brain. And the snapshots show how each part of the brain works between each other. Okay, so it's the same data over 
uh, different time steps, except different time steps mean only the weights on edges change. Okay. Uh, I think node features don't change. And the, the nodes definitely not, don't change. The, the number of nodes are the same. Okay. Um, as I said, mostly the related, the related work is on from the application side. Usually uh, every work you look, they either uh, collapse the time dimension or the space dimension. Here we keep both. Um, and another common practice, which we also do here, is that there is still a, a bit of manual feature, uh, feature creation, feature selection, which is the actual scan actually has uh, much more detail. But what we do is we manually group some parts of the brain into a single node. The command. Okay, so you are with we manually. Uh, uh, put together parts of the brain into, into nodes, uh, which is requires manual input. But so far, uh, every other, other work does that. There has been some work, previous work, where uh, authors studied uh, uh, how this feature creation can be done using a, a deep learning basically learning the nodes, uh, but we don't do it here. Actually, they mentioned it in the future work that that would be a, an, an important direction to take this work towards. But obviously it would make things a lot more complicated, to, especially if you want to make it end-to-end, -end. If, you, if you want to train end-to-end, -end, right? Uh, you create a graph, subgraph, no, a higher level graph from a large graph, and then train for it, it would be quite complex. Maybe we could consider uh, learning on a massive graph, but that's another problem. We'll come to those uh, uh, later again when we look at the experiments. Okay, let's look at the method. So we have really three parts in our uh, model, maybe I should just scroll down here. There are lots of nice plots. I'll, I'll explain those. But let's look at the architecture first, the figure two here. So the input is a, a feature matrix. Uh, capital N is the number of nodes. Capital T is the number of time steps. And X is the feature matrix. We also will have an uh, edge matrix. Oh, and uh, um, uh, uh, so this is the features of each edge. So these are the features of each edge, and these are the features of each node, which, which are also inputs to our model. Interestingly, edge features are actually single numbers, uh, but in, in principle, they could also be vectors. Uh, okay, so first we get the, the X. Uh, the node, node features as input. Notice that there is no graph here. We apply this temporal convolutional network, which basically, I think it's only three la layers deep. It convolves uh, on those features, reducing dimension from P, this can be in several hundreds, up to a predefined 16. Okay. Uh, we, there will be experiments of where we skip this temporal model component, uh, and we will uh, we can achieve a similar performance, but at a much larger cost. Because obviously, if you don't reduce dimension here, time dimension here, uh, the model becomes much larger. Basically, on, on from another perspective, we could see the this the temporal model as a dimension reduction technique, right? Reducing the time dimension with a learned model, a convolutional model. Second part is when we have the reduced dimensional node features as input plus uh, the, the edge features as inputs. And now this graph uh, network block, which has a, which also has two components, 
is not a usual graph convolution or graph attention. This is actually interesting because here we have uh, uh, two parts. One is the edge model, the other one is a node model. And they are both MLPs. Again, in principle, they can be any other models, but here, and I guess also usually, those are MLPs. So this, this technique is also taken from another paper uh, from 2020 or 2021 uh, that introduces this sort of graph network. Um, uh, but the idea is that you also, also use it together with the temporal model. Uh, I'll go into the details of the graph network in a moment, but let's finish the architecture first. And then the third part of the architecture is graph pooling. So basically, after we do the graph, graph network uh, learning, we end up with another X matrix with changed features, which have now been updated using uh, its neighboring or actually, uh, multi, uh, actually using any number of nodes and feature uh, and, and edge features on the graph. Uh, dimension is the same as x, x prime at the beginning, but now these features have changed because we use a graph model here. And then uh, we do graph pooling, here. we do a pooling here. Uh, so in this paper, we look at two pooling methods. Uh, a, sim a simpler one would be simple averaging or summing, but uh, usually those don't work very well in practice. We have also observed that, by the way. If you simply pull, if you simply add or average uh, node features, the, the, there is too much smoothing, right? Because some of the nodes are not as important. So, which is why they, they start, they use this other differential pooling method, which is a learning uh, method. It learns how to uh, pull node features together to get a graph feature, graph uh, uh, a representation. Concatenation is simple. We just put all node uh, representations after each other, cre creating one large representation for the graph. Obviously, obviously this has lots of limitations. Uh, in this case, it works because all our graphs have the same number of nodes, as I said at the beginning. Okay. Uh, we look into the details of differential pooling also. And then afterwards, we have a flattening Level, uh, label that basically just flattens the, the embedding, the change reduces dimension, and then we put a seed point for binary classification. So this one is for a, a sex prediction. Uh, you can have multi class classification also if you want. But in this case, we have a seed point here for binary classification. Okay. I, I've been speaking for a while now. Any comments, questions? about the model. No? Cool. Yes, we can go back and look at the material component of the model. So the TCN uh, is really a convolution uh, over the time steps. Here you go, temporal convolutional networks. Uh, they also mentioned that RNNs like LSTMs would work. We would expect them to work similarly well, maybe even less well, but at a much higher cost. Uh, they don't mention uh, transformers or any attention here. Uh, uh, I guess I don't know why, but they don't mention that. Uh, basically, our choices are convolutions or LSTMs. Actually, which was a convolution. And you will see also with experiments that it's the right choice. Uh, they use uh, uh, one dimensional filters to convolve over time dimension. Uh, and then they also convolve only with elements from earlier time steps from previous layers, thus preserving temporal order. So we don't convolve with the future steps. It's also a uh, norm. Uh, common thing to do with, with uh, convolutions on, on time. Uh, basically, that's the definition. Or there is also this uh, a dilation fact factor here. This is the dilation factor. 
which basically means uh, we take the, uh, the observations from far past, far in the past, less with less weight. So because it's it's exponentially less weight. So there is the exponential thing. L is the is a layer. Okay. Any comments here? I didn't talk about defining the graph, but as, as usual, we have a set of vertices, set of edges, uh, and we have a feature matrix for nodes. Uh, for edges, in this case, dimension is one, as you can see, and then adjust the matrix. Okay. Let's talk about the graph block. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit better because it's easier to read. Okay. So when we talk about the graph part, we need to introduce uh, two components. One is the one is one works over the edges, so like this function psi e. The other one works over vertices called psi b. So the first one basically is an M both of them are MLPs actually. The first one finds a new feature vector for for edges, taking the edge feature and the node features as input. The other one updates the node features, taking the updated edge feature and the current node feature as input. Okay. Um, Oh, when we update the edge feature, uh, we also actually use this other uh, row uh, function, which basically, so that when we work with edge, we take the only the edge and it's, uh, it is in the nodes around it. When we are working with a, with a node, we take the node and all edges and uh, around it as input. Okay, so this, uh, Big epsilon is uh, is the set of edges around the given node. Okay, uh, and and we also I think we do three layers here, which means we would look at three hop connections. But as you can see, there is no graph convolution. I guess this is sort of similar, but there is no exactly graph convolution or retention here. Maybe these are actually kind of similar because we have an MLP which learns weights. I guess we could kind of interpret it as uh, weights on for the nodes' neighbors. But uh, to me, this was a bit this 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 model was new. Has anyone actually seen these models before? No. Cool. Okay. Uh, oh yes, also this GN block blocks uh, require directed edges. To fix this, we change our undirected graph to have well uh, to have two directed edges instead of one on undirected for each direction. There is no requirement for no loops, so it's fine. Just a little trick we do to be able to use this model. Cool. Any comments here? Uh, yeah, quick one. Why is there a requirement for the edges to be directed? Sorry, maybe I, I missed this. Or... Uh, that's just how this original paper works. I think it's for this psi e function. Uh, maybe you could simply say when you look at the neighbors, look either way. I haven't looked into the details of these functions because I would have to go read the other paper from where they took the method. Uh, or basically they are saying the method we, we took from this other paper from uh, oh, 2018 actually, maybe, maybe that's why. So this paper is from 2018. And the, the, the paper they, they cite. The current one we are presenting today is actually from this year, published maybe a week ago. Uh, anyway, 
this, this paper they refer to uses uh, directed edges. So they convert the graph into directed one uh, just so they can use the this this paper. At the end, we can go investigate a bit more what was what's in this paper, which I haven't read. Okay. Okay. Graph pooling. So at the end, we need to create an embedding because this is a graph classification problem, not a node classification. Right? We are trying to classify if the per person whose scan we took was a man or a woman. It's a binary uh, gender classification problem. Uh, we need to create an embedding uh, for the graph. There were also a few other uh, pro uh, problems that they mentioned, but they're all about the graph, not about individual nodes. So we need to uh, add the pooling layer. And as I said, we could do a concatenation, which would work here uh, as they mentioned, because all graphs in our database have the same dimension. So that's fine, right? Because we pre-process all graphs into the same number of nodes. So there is no problem here. However, we will end up with a fairly large uh, embedding for the for the graph. Uh, we do experiments and then we check uh, which one is better. And interestingly, concatenation is usually better than the fancy method we study later, uh, which I find quite interesting. Uh, and the fancy method is called differential pooling. Basically, it's a learnable method that learns how to uh, how to pool well how to uh, combine uh, nodes from the graph uh, into a graph embedding okay so it takes the just symmetrics it's a multi-step method it takes an adjust symmetrics and node embeddings as input and returns updated version and the idea is that we start with a single node, and then we iteratively add nodes uh, to the existing uh, group, okay? Uh, L really actually means la layer. So I think we go in topological order for some sort of topology. Oh, maybe that's why we need uh, directed. No, doesn't make sense. We need some order to iteratively add nodes into the in initial node. And then we update the uh, just symmetrics accordingly and the uh, feature metrics. Okay. So here we will have two uh, two uh, intermediate uh, matrices. So the first one is is a, is a GNN here. Uh, I they don't mention what GNN exactly they use actually. I think it's a, it's a GS, GCN. I think. I think it's a GCM, I'm not sure. Uh, but this one actually learns uh, 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 new embeddings, so that we, which we will use later. And then the next part is another GNN uh, uh, that, that later applied uh, with the softmax. This S matrix is actually important because we will study it uh, trying to interpret uh, the results, okay? This will feature more uh, later in the in the experiments. Anyway, after we compute Z and S, we can multiply them and uh, compute the new feature matrix and the new adjust matrix. Ben? Um, so the uh, N F plus one is something of X a priori or just from? I did understand, Alexander. Can you repeat? Oh, please? sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. So the NL plus one, uh, the number of nodes of the next graph, is this like some parameter you set up a priori? Okay, it's iterative, right? You start with L1, so you have one node. And then iteratively, uh, you add more layers. So it says, is, uh, let me actually find the beginning. Um, I think it should be somewhere here. If at layer L does receives both and just metrics and the node embedding metrics. So uh, graph name 
network civility gen which is so it's the same gen and used for both but let me find the part that they mentioned uh, that it's it's an oh here there you go um we employ the differential pooling operator introduced by Ying et al uh, commonly called diff pool which learns how to sequentially collapse nodes into smaller clusters until only a single node with the final embedding exists. So you add nodes into, it collapse into each other. You start with one and then you put more nodes and then more nodes and then more. As you do that, in the process, you're also learning how they are combined, right? And then as you combine them into a single node, you end up with one single embedding which becomes the graph embedding. Does it answer the question? Mm -hmm. so, so L here is for each uh, iteration. So L is, we can think of L is like an iteration counter. So, wait, is it, so it's not a layer, so it's an iter iter iteration uh, for the- Yeah, yeah layer, it is not a neural network layer. I see what you mean. This is not a neural network layer. Basically means you start with one node here, and then the next layer are its neighbors. Okay, then you have one node. And then the next step is all nodes that that are uh, neighbors of the current one. So those are the layers. Okay. Right. I'm still a bit confused. Like, so the NL plus one. So if this like, so you would need some parameters to uh, input AL plus one or whatever. It does um, so we put it, this inside the for loop. Like we put this under a for loop, and okay, then okay. L goes from zero. I guess L zero would be the input matrix A, and then at the end, adjusting matrix is just one number. Right? It is just one because we have one node left. Does it does it help? Um, I think. Thank you. And then you can see that here, if we talk about the dimensions, uh, Z and S each have a different dimension on each layer, right? On each iteration, because their dimensions actually decrease. I think it's also here that at each next step, their dimensions are smaller, right? Yeah. So we collapse nodes into each other. And then at the end, when we multiply S and Z, basically we end up, so look at the dimensions here. So here we have S times Z, right? So we have NN times NF. So basically we end up with NL plus one times F prime. So F prime is the feature dimension of each node. And as NL plus one decreases, we end up with the dimension uh, well, F prime times one, right? You end up with one single embedding. Okay, I think I understand. Thank similarly, you. Sure. similarly, if you look at the A matrix, because you multiply it on both, uh, A with an S on both sides, we did decrease, we keep it square, but we kind of shrink it into a single number. Okay? More comments before we speak about experiments. Cool. This is basically the whole architecture. Uh, we will experiment with removing one component. Also, we will experiment with uh, diff pool versus uh, concatenation. Okay. Uh, experiments, let's have a quick look. As I said, we will uh, there are some terminologies here which I didn't quite understand, but the idea is that we take data from biobank, take it from some fancy machine, Siemens, something. Anyone knows about this, feel free to jump in and explain. But basically, there is a scanner that took the, the photos, which was pre processed uh, with some parameters. <laughs> So those are very specific. What we care about really is that there were 490 time steps per scan. Again, each, each 
a graph had the same number of time steps, which also helps with our modeling uh, principles, I think. Uh, uh, and then we also have 35,000 uh, uh, scans or graphs, uh, approximately equal female, male. We also have information about their ages. Uh, and this data set is actually publicly available. Anyone can look at that, which is actually quite interesting because if you want a data graph database, which also has a time spectrum that's publicly available, this is the first one I've seen. There may be others, but this type of data makes more sense for uh, graphs that change over time. Okay, cementing the models, as I said, there's only one edge feature. Uh, is the, we, we create the just symmetrices. I think that don't need to worry too much. Each graph has only 68 nodes. It's very small compared to, to other applications. Um, time points I mentioned. Uh, they also do hyperparameter tuning with those ranges, you know, drop out in a range uh, or thresholding. I should talk about thresholding. So, thresholding we do because uh, I mentioned this earlier uh, because we have uh, weights on edges and uh, and because it's not it has it's not clear from literature what's the best way to threshold edges so if the num if the number on the edge is below five percent should be uh, thresholded right and then the experiment, that's why they have experiment with a number, with not several numbers, because literature does, is not conclusive and what's the best way. So you also tune this as a hyperparameter. The learning rate by DK are the normal, normal things, um, which are also hyperparameter tuned. We do also cross validation, uh, 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 five fold. So we, we do five fold, it's also stratified, which means we try to keep the balance between various properties of, of, of people that were, that were scaled relatively equal. So we don't end up splitting by accident very, by accident very inequally. So those are all very uh, standard practices. Okay, let's look at these plots. This is actually quite interesting. So uh, on, the, on the left, we have the time series. The uh, both time series extracted from four brain regions. So you can see the, the edge values, how they change. Okay. Over time, this is the sort of time series we have. Uh, and on the right, we have actually the graph, uh, uh, the graph, and uh, I think the boldness represents uh, the strength uh, of, of edges the value of edges, and I think colors, let's see what colors represent. Color according to brain region. Oh, and colors represent the brain regions. Yeah, makes sense. There are cooler plots here if you want to see, and they plot it on the, on the brain, on the brain image. Let's see if I can find it down here. So if you look only at four regions, uh, so those are actually interesting because uh, those are not handcrafted brain regions, right? They, they run this based on uh, the explainability of the model. Maybe I shouldn't jump here, but, um, but basically if you try to explain uh, the model, you can represent its findings on a, on a brain. And then that kind of quite accurately shows uh, well-known brain regions, the precortex, the middle part and, and whatnot. Okay, let's go back to the previous results. Actually, any comments here? No, okay. Um, oh, this is another, they used weights and, bi weights and biases, which is a really cool uh, and actually currently very popular way of tracking and tuning your models. Uh, basically, they also used, used it to visualize the hyperparameter tuning. So each 
line represents uh, one uh, one random search. So you know, drop out, drop out value, learning rate, and whatnot, and then the validation loss. So you basically can plot this and see where you end up. The highest they found is here. Uh, you can actually find the values here, thresholding at 20, interesting. Uh, but for example, thresholding at 40 usually ends up with fairly low numbers. But in, it, this is, they also mentioned that that's only in this specific case. Uh, in other cases, different values of thresholding may be better. So we don't know, there is no universally good thresholding, which is why they had to experiment, they, they had to uh, hyper -tune. Okay. Let's look at results. Um, so these ones are, this is a ablation study. Uh, so N means we use the node model. E means we use the edge model, okay? Uh, concat we use, we, means we could be used concatenation for pooling. D4 is the differential pooling. So basically here yeah, we have nodes and edges not on edges with each one or only nodes or only only uh, pooling. So there is no GNN learning, graph learning at the beginning. There is a the, the bit of GNN in deep pooling, but concatenation is basically just take current features and put them, concatenate them and then classify. Very simple, forget about the graph structure completely. Uh, this is a GCN method used without the time scale. So there is no time. So this, this one is another deep learning method without any uh, time component, I think. Uh, the last two are not deep learning, like uh, XGBoost and SVM, just for a, uh, as a baseline. They, are, they don't have any parameters. Okay, and as you can see, the time components will have many more parameters time models because well, they also have the time component. These others, I think they just average the uh, edge weights. Okay, uh, interesting observations. Concatenation works better than the fancy differential pooling. But the problem is it's hard to find, is to explain the models without differential pooling. And that's, uh, because we, as I said before, we need to use those S matrices. These S matrices is what we use for it, for uh, explainability. The, the brain images I showed are done using the S matrix. So if you want better explainability, you have to use the diff tool, but ironically, simpler concat works quite a bit better, right? can see the numbers, it's always accuracy, sensitivity, all of them are a bit better. Parameters are pretty much the same. Any comments here? Uh, yeah, good question. So I guess the concatenation always outperforms, well, in this case, diff pool. So I'm mm -hmm. sort of <clears throat> wondering, do they only add this diff pool method in the paper just for explainability? Or was mm -hmm. there? another like reason why they would mention diff pool mm. at all? Well, normally I, 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 I would try something better than concat because first of all, if you have graphs that have different number of edges, a different number of nodes, you can't concatenate, right? And it's a bit of a problem. So concat works only in this specific case. But yes, they spend a, quite of like half of the paper uh, talking about explainability, giving results and diagrams about, about explainability. So it's actually an important contribution for the paper. Okay. So let's look some more results. So this one is with a different data set. Uh, same metrics. Uh, Again, we do a different data set, but I think it's not too interesting because the results are very similar. What is interesting, let me find that one. So this one is, uh, oh, this one is only, for example, here there is a paper, 
result experiment only on uh, when there is no time component block. Okay, what if we remove the time time component? You can see that actually the metrics are similar, but the parameters multiplied by like a hundred. This is ten by ten because we don't do the, the, the time dimension reduction. Then, okay? so otherwise the metric, the metrics are actually very similar. The other experiment here is that what if we use an LSTM instead of the TCM? Again, very similar metrics, except uh, training time. I think I've highlighted somewhere here, training time is like four or five times higher. And this is when they use A100 GPUs. I think those are the fastest, more capable GPUs in existence right now. Uh, so if you use an LSTM, it just takes much longer to train. Um, the other experiment is if there is no thresholding at all, okay? And with metrics, are, okay, so all metrics are averaged across five test sets, by the way, except I think except for LSTMs because it took so long, they couldn't run enough experiments to average, but it's fine. Here also, uh, we we do experiments with uh, without thresholding, and the results are actually very similar. Uh, if you look here, like the best is again M plus E concat, same as there, 0, 92, very similar. If there is no thresholding, uh, sensitivity or accuracy also very similar. Uh, so. Uh, I guess, uh, which is good news. We don't have to threshold. Uh, threshold means we remove weights with too low, uh, we remove edges with too low weights. Interesting result also, I guess. This part is for explainability. So this is the uh, weights of the TCN kernel, convolution kernel kernel. So it's an eight on seven, I think eight is, Eight uh, is the output channels, number of output channels, and seven is the kernel array. array. And basically, you can look at the kernel here. Uh, it's fine, not too interesting. This one is with the concatenation. If you concatenate, basically, we have a much bigger, uh, much bigger uh, weight of weight for the for the convolutions because. Uh, these are all well put together. Let's actually uh, scroll down to look at the, here, this one, I like this one, this, this explainability. So basically they use hierarchical clustering. Uh, and as you can see here on the right and on, on the bottom, so the upper, the upper, the upper diagonal matrix represents uh, it's an explainability thing. Basically saying higher numbers, so you can see that the uh, yellow gets higher, uh, mean that the, that the region of the brain is more important for this specific task, okay? And then if you do the clustering, hierarchical clustering is good in this case, because we can look at different levels of, of hierarchy. And then if you look at this clustering, I think if you look at only four, uh, of the, uh, only four clusters, you will see these brain images, which are actually very meaningful. Which is why, which is why they uh, they say that there is a lot of explainability in this method, particularly in the in the in the gen, in the graph model they used because of the S matrix. Right? Remember, this is the plot. This plot is the S, S matrix. Okay. And the bottom is the graph with the corrections. Uh, and you can even see that, uh, uh, well, that's fine. So basically this just represent uh, the connections between uh, nodes. Okay. Let's scroll down a bit more, some more brain images with uh, more clusters here, uh, with using the same technique, which is actually really interesting because is, 
show uh, brain comp brain parts, meaningful brain parts, uh, which is encouraging in terms of explainability. Uh, again, they also try to make it clear that they are not arguing that because mo model uh, uses certain parts of uh, certain nodes that represent certain parts of the brain, doesn't mean that that's how the brain works, right? We can't necessarily extract it to, to the biology, but it helps us understand the model a bit better, okay? Um, I think it's, I don't wanna go into much more detail. This one is a similar experiment on a different data set, HSHCP, also using uh, two data, um, modes of the two sources of data, the RSF MRI combined with some diffusion data, which is available on a different data set, this HCP data set I used. And basically the interesting observations are that uh, when we combine, uh, when we combine two sources of data, deep learning models actually improve if you look at these numbers, deep learning models all, in, all improve, but SVM and the extra boost do not improve, which is expected, right? And in a funnier way, the non-deep learning models actually, models actually perform comparably even better than deep learning models in a unimodel case on this data set because it's a much smaller data set, which is, also kind of expected because we know that deep learning works only if there is enough data and it works better if there is enough variety of data, right? Like having um, multiple sources of data improves deep learning models. But if it's a small data set, not enough data, deep learning models work as like almost as well. If you look at these numbers, on, sometimes much worse. And the best ones are just comparable to simple models like SVMs, which is also quite interesting, but we kind of we knew that, right? And in the discussion, um, I guess I mentioned that they, 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 as future work, they want to study uh, extensions from this modeling, uh, especially uh, what did I mention at the beginning? They do. Oh, they want to add more data sources like age, IQ, and so on, because there is a, a reasonable uh, expectation that models will improve, deep learning models will improve. But also, they want, instead of using the, this handcrafted, desiccant, Kiliani method of creating the graph, they want to study uh, using the entire. Uh, scan as the as a graph, and not uh, combining them into uh, higher level nodes manually, right? And letting the model learn those relationships. A uh, couple of other interesting things about the paper before I finish, and we can ask more questions. Everything is open sourced. You can access everything on GitHub. Experiments, uh, parameters, everything is there. They also mention. Which, which author do to what, did what work, which is pretty cool. They have quite a few authors, so they mentioned who did exactly what. And I think that's all. Any comments, questions? No? Okay, I'll end the presentation. Oh, actually. Okay, I'll end the presentation here. Uh, the recording here.